president use his power, both the purse strings and the spotlight associated with the office, to push forward his policy agenda at the state level. And this has been widely studied in large-scale policy reforms, such as the New Deal and the Great Society. Um, and it's coming into view again with the Obama presidency with op-eds like this one uh, ominously asking, is the president exploiting the state's fine of fiscal woes to push his policies? <laughs> We're interested specifically in Race to the Top, which Obama described as the single most ambitious, meaningful education effort we've attempted in this country <coughs> in generations. Race to the Top was implemented on the heels of the Great Recession as part of the American Recovery and the Investment Act of 2009, and it was indeed on a massive scale, so it made available $4.35 billion to states in exchange for implementing a particular set of policies described by the Department of Ed. Uh, overall, 40 states applied to the competition in three rounds, and those states that won and actually had to follow through and implement these policies serve 45% of the nation's K-12 students. Race to the top was unprecedented among government, politici uh, government competitions for its policy prescription. So states were selected on the basis of past policy achievement, commitment to future policy implementation, and sort of the credibility of those promises as evidenced by buy-in from key actors around the state, so primarily state boards of education and unions. And uh, can you see these? These are uh, figures from another paper by Howell um, showing that Race to the Top indeed had a causal effect on policy making at the state level. So uh, on the left, we see years on the x-axis with uh, the vertical line in 2009, when Race to the Top was announced. And on the y-axis, we see the proportion of, of all policies incentivized by Race to the Top that were enacted by the states in a given year. And we project the, the trend line outward beyond uh, the pre-2009 trend out beyond 2009, just to, to highlight the contrast between pre- and post-2009 trends in policy implementation. Uh, we have the same figure on the right, disaggregated by winners, uh, race to the top winners with the blue line above, applicants who never won in the green line, and those states that never applied in red. And to the extent that you believe that this is a causal story, you also see that there are significant spillovers, which was very much by design. So the purpose of this paper is to take, take this figure as a starting point and then to ask how exactly, what, what were the mechanisms by which all this policy change occurred. And we focus on two sort of tools that the president has at his disposal, money and attention. Money being offering a financial incentive at a time when states were particularly hard hit in their education budgets by the Great Recession, uh, and attention. So being able to focus policymakers' attention on a particular set of policies and bump them up on their agendas. And we find suggestive evidence in support of both mechanisms. I'll spend a minute talking about our data collection process. So we, we relied on two sources. The first was the actual application submitted by the states to the competition. And these are publicly available, and they follow the structure of a document um, released by the Department of Education, which was very prescriptive about the policy domains in which they wanted to see change, and exactly the sorts of changes they wanted to see. So we were, uh, a group of research assistants was able to essentially act as competition judges and code whether each of the, uh, both past achievements and future commitments that the states made satisfied the competition requirements. Our coding was binary, just zero or one, and we uh, kept the standard pretty high. We followed the, the language of the application pretty closely and, and that created a, a, a nice amount of variation in the data. We also used state legislative histories. So we pulled bills going back to 2001, again related to these race to the top policies, and were able to evaluate whether they satisfied the competition standards. Um, in certain policy areas, there could be a reform kind of circumventing the legislative process, and in those cases, we rely on interest groups that were particularly interested in these areas. Um, 
And with, with those two data sets together with budget data from the US Census, we were able to look at this first mechanism of money and to exploit the fact that states' education budgets were differentially impacted by the Great Recession. So we use as our as our primary uh, independent variable the change in love per capita state education revenue from 2007 to 2009. Uh, and then the way that looks is most states lost education revenues from 2007 to 2009. A couple gained. Um, but there's, uh, there's a nice amount of variation in how much they lost. So some, some states lost a little, some states lost a lot. And using that, we're able to ask three big questions. So first, are cash-strapped states more likely to apply to the competition uh, conditional on applying? Do they make more policy promises? And then, do these policies, do these promises actually translate into action? We classify the policies into two different types for some of these analyses, and it, it, it'll look unclear why we do this when I present the results, but there's also some variation in how much investment of financial resources is required to get these policies going up front. So on the very cheap end, states could join a consortium uh, to reevaluate the educational standards in their state. This is an investment of time, but not necessarily a large investment of money. On the very expensive end, we have redesigning student data systems to track student achievement over time and link that to their teacher data in order to inform teacher evaluations, which you can imagine is very expensive for states that don't have the infrastructure. And here are our results. So first, uh, do cash-strapped states apply more? Yes, we, we see a small but significant effect of education revenue changes on the probability of applying, which means the more you lost, the more likely you are to apply. Um, conditional on, on applying, the cash-strapped states make more policy commitments. When we look at the overall sample of policies, we don't see an effect, but this is where the distinction between cheap and expensive policies becomes very interesting. Because estimating effects separately, we see that cash-strapped states are much likelier to promise on cheap policies. States that are relatively better off are more likely to promise on expensive policies. So a story that we can tell here is that cash-strapped states are trying to maximize their chances of winning to recover their budgets while minimizing how much money they actually have to spend up front. Uh, whereas states that are a little better off might be trying to use the competition for different purposes. To, to pursue larger scale reforms. And do promises translate into action? We find that the cash strapped states that are promising on cheap policies are not following through on those policies. We do, however, find that states with more money, the states that suffered less, are following through on expensive policies and less so on cheap policies. So this is, again, consistent with the story that they're pursuing some kind of reform agenda. And we see these effects, uh, we, we see a strong effect of budgets for winners, uh, but not losers. So uh, this, is, this is more easily seen in a figure where we again plot policy, the probability of policy adoption in the y-axis and the change in log per capita state education revenue on the x-axis, doing this separately for winners in green and losers in red, expensive policies on the left and cheap policies on the right. And we see that Winners implement more policies across the board, which makes sense. Uh, cheap policies are implemented more across the board as well, which is subtle here, but it's, it's statistically significant. And, and we see that this relationship between budgets and policy adoption is more pronounced, that is the, we, the slope is, is steeper and more positive for winners. So now we, we turn to our second mechanism, which is salience. And the idea here is that Race to the top focused media attention on a limited set of policies, what Mitan tells call an agenda subsidy. They say, in essence, the federal government either raises the visibility of an issue or creates an action forcing mechanism at the state level, thereby pushing it up an agenda of decision makers. So our argument isn't, isn't that salience changes the calculus of, of a particular lawmaker in evaluating a policy, it only raises the probability that, that that policymaker will encounter that policy at all, that, that they'll have to take a vote on that policy. And as such, we believe that the standard predictor of legislative productivity, unified government, is going to start to matter more after race 
to the top once these policies are coming to the table. And that's exactly what we see. So here we estimate the effects of unified government in the pre and post race to the top period on policy implementation. And if, if you look at the, the fourth column, which is our full model, you see that unified government across the entire sample on average does not have an effect. You see that the post race to the top period predictably has a strong effect. Uh, but if, if you look down at the bottom, most importantly, uh, the interaction, so the effect of unified government after race to the top is announced is suddenly statistically significant and strong, as, as opposed to the effect prior, uh, prior to race to the top. And we run the same model on a set of policy controls. Uh, this is the fifth column. So these are policies that were not incentivized by race to the top at all. And as you can see, we, we, we don't see the same pattern here. Uh, a couple additional findings. The effect of unified government is particularly strong for race to the top winners. Uh, it's also particularly strong for democratic regimes, which of course you'd expect, but what's really interesting is that it's present for Republican regimes as well. And uh, that's it. I, I'll just summarize my findings. Um, we look at two possible mechanisms to try to explain why race to the top had the effect that it did on state policy making, money and salience. Uh, when we look at money, we see that states that suffered more from the Great Recession were more likely to apply to race to the top. They were more likely to make cheaper promises, but they didn't necessarily follow through on those promises in the same way as states that were financially better off and making more expensive policy promises. Uh, turning to salience, we find that once these policies get on state legislators' agendas, the effect of unified government suddenly becomes important. And we see this particularly for Democratic majorities and particularly 